welcome back beloved today's video we are going over psalm 2 and the title is the king is coming i'm super excited about doing this the format's going to be a little different this week i'm actually teaching this uh, to a local bible study at my church and so pretty straightforward i'm going to go through it i've made this video before about a year ago uh nowhere near uh what i believe in my opinion will be as good as today there's so many more scriptures i forgot to tie in and so i'll go through it but every now and then i'll pause it on a question and uh, if you have family members you can discuss it with your family members i hope you do pause it answer the questions for yourself and then i'll answer the question a bit but i won't go like i'm not going to fully exegete the whole question right because i want you guys to really come to a full understanding of psalm 2 that's my main goal for the for the youtube channel not necessarily the church uh bible study right and so psalm 2 the king is coming this is a messianic psalm um this is written about 1000 years before jesus christ was born it is written by king david it's one of my favorite messianic prophecies, and I can't wait to get into it with you guys. So I'm just going to jump right in. Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Why do the nations rage? And that just means nations, the world, the Gentiles. Why do the nations rage? They are angry. And the people plot a vain thing. The, the nations are raging. They're plotting a vain or worthless thing. It says the kings of the earth, the rulers set themselves the rulers take counsel they, they they speak together together against the lord against yahweh and against his anointed okay and that word anointed right like we know jesus's last name is not christ now jesus is the christ but that just means anointed comes from the hebrew to anointed it means messiah he's the jesus is the messiah so you could read this against the lord and against his anointed against his this is talking about jesus the messiah now there's a couple holy spirit given interpretations of, and fulfillments of this paul wrote in acts chapter 4 okay he says uh, this was fulfilled by the mouth of your servant David had said, right? So he's, he's talking about the fulfillment of this. This is now New Testament after Christ died. And he says, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? He quotes this song. He's saying, look, this has been fulfilled. The kings of the earth took their stand. The rulers are gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So clearly he's saying that word anointed means Christ. And he says, look, this is fulfilled because truly your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, Herod and Pontius Pilate with the nations and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So we hear about the, the sovereign election that, that Jesus came, right? God blinded their eyes. They killed the son of God. Because that was what was determined to be happened. That was what was prophesied, that Jesus would die for the sins of his people. That being said, Paul writes in Acts, excuse me, Paul didn't write Acts, but in Acts it's written, I should say God wrote, because wrote, the Holy Spirit wrote the whole Bible, um, that this was fulfilled there. But like most prophecies, there's multiple fulfillments, okay? There's multiple, um, there's usually an original fulfillment and then a final fulfillment. And so in Revelation 10, 7, this is, so this is now an eschatological fulfillment. Um, this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. It says, in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, this is like towards the end of the tribulation now. When he's about to sound, it says the mystery of God would be finished. This is one of the most fascinating Bible verses. There's a lot of mystery to it. And one day this trumpet will be blown during the tribulation and the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. I just love, this is probably my favorite verse in the whole Bible. I'm like, Lord, I can't wait till this day and the whole mystery, all of it is completely fulfilled. Um, but then in Revelation 11, 15, it says, then the seventh angel sounded. So this is when that mystery, the culmination of that mystery is. And there's loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So part of that mystery is that right now uh, we know the earth is the Lord in all its fullness, but the devil still has authority on this world. The demonic entities still have authority on this world. The devil offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, right? So we know he has 
a certain amount of authority of, under the sovereign rulership of God, under Yahweh. That being said, there's coming a time, right, when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah, his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So he has all the authority. He just hasn't taken that rulership just yet for his purposes, for his glory. So after this, two verses down, the 24 elders in heaven, they all say, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you've taken your great power and reigned. They're thanking him, saying, you've, you've finally, like, you've took back the keys, the kingdom, the whole earth, you've redeemed it, but now you're reigning not just uh, in heaven, but on earth, right? Our Father who art in heaven uh, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we pray. That's our prayer, right? So then it goes on to say, and you see this, this prophecy again, the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged, right? So you see that I'm not going to go through the rest of this now, um, but the nations were angry. It's the same in, in New King James. I believe it's the nations raged, you know, and your wrath has come. So there's multiple fulfillments. So just to go back, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? They're taking counsel against the Lord. They're, they're plotting that rebellion against the Lord. Originally, they did that to Jesus and they, they crucified him. The Gentiles and the Jews together plotted that worthless thing. And in the end, we know there's going to be a rebellion against Jesus when he comes back um, as the lion, not, not as the lamb, right? This is a second coming prophecy. We're hearing about the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so the question is, and you should pause it here and discuss, why are the nations and individuals enraged and upset? Why are the nations and individuals, like non-believers, why are they enraged? What enrages them the most about God. Pause and welcome back. <laughs> and so uh, I, I love it. The Psalm just answers this. I don't even have to answer it for you. They're plotting this worthless thing. And this is what they say. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So before I was born again and before anybody's born again, the number one thing that makes us hate God is we love our sin. So those bonds, those Cords, that's the law, the law of God, his rulership, the fact that he is the judge and has appointed a day to judge the world in righteousness through the man, Christ Jesus, right? So we don't like that. We hate the law. We love our sins. So we naturally struggle against them. When you're born again, you see them as loving, like love cords to protect you from yourself. You don't see them as bonds and chains anymore, right? You, you become a bond servant of Christ, right? You're freed from the law. Um, but the world and the nations are going to go in a way where they want to break those bonds. The Bible describes mankind as in rebellion against God, not as ignorant of God. Luke chapter 19, Jesus tells a parable uh, and, and essentially saying his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man, Jesus Christ, to reign over us. That's the problem we have with God. We, we deny his lordship. We don't want him to reign over us. So the question is, now this is an important question. Take some time and discuss this, especially if you have a family. How do we as believers in Jesus handle the law? How do we handle the law, the law of God? Jesus, you know, Paul wrote, do, do we get rid of the law? No, we actually establish the law. What does it mean to establish the law? How do we handle the law? What do we do with it? Is it null and void? What is the purpose of the law? Do we view it as a yoke? Is it a burden? Pause and welcome back. <laughs> and so how do we uh, as believers in Jesus handle the law? I'm not going to completely exegete this. The, the law is our tutor to bring us to Christ. The law is a mirror. Before we're born again, we look in it and it's designed, it is actually kills us. It shows us the holy nature of God, his perfection, that he will not dwell with sin. He will not acquit the guilty. And as you look into the perfect law of God, you look back on yourself like a mirror. And for me personally, I saw how disgusting I was, how full of sin I was, how hate-filled I was, how sexually immoral I was. I began to feel the weight of my sin and that prepares your heart. It turns over your heart 
to where you will just, as soon as you see that God has provided a savior, as soon as you hear the gospel, your heart will just latch on to him and soak him in, right? And that's what I believe the main purpose of the law is. It's also to give us a standard to try to follow. We, we don't cast off the law. We can't live in sin, but we do fall into sin. So it is, it is for that as well. So no, it's not null and void, but it cannot save you. Uh, do we view it as a yoke or a burden? Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. So uh, yes, there is a certain striving with Jesus. There's a certain standard. If uh, Let anyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The, the difference is when you're born again, the sun sets you free. He gets rid of your old lusts and he gives you new desires. Now you're not perfect. You still have a body of flesh. You still desire to sin. And it's, it can be a struggle sometimes, especially if you give into it and it gets worse and worse, you develop a habit. But Jesus's yoke, which is a yoke, is light because the Holy Spirit washes you from your sins and supernaturally gives you the ability to walk in a pleasing way with God. His wrath does not abide on you. You do not follow the law because you're like, oh, if I, you know, I got to follow it or else I'm going to go to hell. No, you know, you've been forgiven and washed and granted eternal life. And you love this savior who died for you and granted you eternal life. And so that's why you do your best to follow the law and to follow your king and, and to follow his, his rules. But nobody can fully keep the law, right? So that's how I view the law. That is not a perfect example, but I want to move on to the psalm. Moving on. He who, so they, they're plotting a vain thing against the Lord, against his anointed. The nations are raging. Then it says, this is some scary language. Second coming of Christ's prophecies are some scary prophecies, but this is our God. He who sits in the heavens will laugh the Lord will hold them in derision. That means he'll deride them. He'll, he'll scoff at them and make fun of them, it basically means. Then he'll speak to them in his wrath, wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. When God speaks to you in wrath, go read the first couple chapters of Deuteronomy, look in Exodus, Numbers. Think of when God came in fire to, you know, to, to, to the children of Israel, the Hebrews in the desert. He came to them in a mountain with fire and tempestuous and darkness and gloom. And he spoke to them in wrath and he put his, his fear in them, right? So he's going to speak to the world, the nations in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. He's going to scoff at them. And so my question is, this is important. Why would the Lord laugh and scoff at people? Why would, he, why would he hold them in derision? And only one other time do I really see this. And it's in the book of Proverbs. Solomon is King David's son. He's writing this. And I think it's the clearest call ever for repentance and belief. You have to understand, as we get towards the time of the end, the nations become more and more aware of the gospel. And so many are going to be born again and believe and have faith in Jesus Christ. But many, the majority, because it's, you know, it's, it's the wide road to destruction that many are on, are going to reject that. And when they do that, they incur more and more judgment because there's no worse sin than unbelief in the Son of God, right? And so Proverbs chapter 1 talks about this. So when the Lord's scoffing at you, it's after he has called out and cried out for you to turn to him. Check this out. It says, wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open square. She cries out in the chief concourses at the openings of the gates in the city. She speaks her word. She cries out. God is reaching out to people saying, be wise, come to me. We know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning. People like to make fun, right? Fools hate knowledge. Once again, God never says they're ignorant. It says that they just hate knowledge, right? He goes on to say, turn at my rebuke. That's repentance. Change your mind. Turn. You're going down the wrong road. Just turn around and believe in me, right? That's what Jesus commands. Turn at my rebuke. And I love this. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. My spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. I will make my words known to you. You see, I read the whole Bible before I was born again. I never turned around and just believed in Jesus. <laughs> as soon as I did, I was born again. The spirit came. The words made sense to me. But then it says, because I've called and you refused, I've stretched out my hand and no one regarded because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke. I also, so you see, God has, is not without witness. We see him in creation, his, his eternal power, his divine nature. But most clearly we see God through his son, Jesus Christ, and the faithful preaching and teaching of the word of God that reveals Jesus, right? And when you have that clear revelation from God, 
It's the eternal Holy One that we've sinned against and are in rebellion that has died for us. And to reject that is a scary thing. If people go on and rejecting that, and the Bible says towards the end, people are going to continue rejecting that, and the blasphemy is going to be heightened towards the end, right? And we kind of see that happening in the world now. Because you would have none of that rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When And, and I think this is one of the scariest chapters in the whole Bible. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. It's because they're not seeking God. They're just seeking relief from his judgment, right? Many people want to be saved from hell, but they don't want to be saved from sin right now. They want to enjoy their sin. They'll seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. The Bible clearly describes an end, a termination point of the patience of God. And so as we're preaching the gospel, we need to be faithful to, to make people understand that, that you need to turn to him while his hand is reached out to you. Today is the day of salvation. Do not wait for tomorrow. It says they would have none of my counsel, despise my every rebuke. Therefore, they will eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. This is what you have to understand. The number one thing that's going to lead people to hell, it's not going to be any sin that might be crazy in your mind, although all sin is, is bad, obviously. It's complacency. It, it's, it's not like most of the people that end up in hell are going to be murderers or, or rapists or worshiping a false god, even though most of them are in some way, shape, or form. It's complacency. It's like, I'll do that later. I'll do that later. It's the turning away of the simple. It's just the average person that just doesn't, doesn't really care. It's just, eh, I've got other things to worry about. It's simple. And that's why, even though some people that you preach the gospel to, they seem like good people, um, they're certainly much better than I was before I was born again. It's important you press that on them like, hey, hey, you could be the best person I know. It doesn't matter. We've all fallen short. There's no one who does good, not one. You have to impress that on them. Do not be complacent. But then it says, whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. So this leads to a very important other question. How do non-believers deal with the law and, and that, that requirement? Pause. And welcome back. <laughs> and I believe the answer is pretty straightforward. They either A, cast off the law completely. They live in sin. They don't care. Some people call that antinomianism against law, right? It's using grace as a license to sin if you claim to be a Christian. Or you're just living in the world. You're living in open sin. And we just go and we preach repentance from that sin and believing on Jesus for eternal life. On the other hand, some people use the law as a way to be saved, and it just results in self-righteousness. Very, very dangerous. You have Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, anybody that believes it's Jesus plus anything, right? Jesus plus good works, Jesus plus keeping the Sabbath, Jesus plus baptism, all those things put you back under the law. It is Christ alone. There's salvation in no other name. Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, we were enemies of Christ, dead in our sins. He made us alive. It's Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. So how do non-believers deal with the law? They cast it off or they claim I can, you know, keep it for salvation. They're basically saying, I'm a good person. I've kept the law as best I can. You know, I, I think on Judgment Day, I'll be okay. In fact, that's the number one thing. As, as we're out there preaching the gospel right now in Tennessee, the number one thing I get, and these are all people who go to church, so it's very nerve-wracking to me. They all go to church. We simply walk them through the gospel, and it's always 90% of the time the same thing. Well, I've done my best to keep it, and I feel like God will understand that. He knows my heart, and he'll let me into heaven. They have no concept of, of the law kills us. They have no concept that we're already under the condemnation. We are all, you know, when you're born, under, born in, you're literally born in sin. You come out with a very bad birth. Therefore, you need to be born again, Jesus said. You must be born again. The law kills. So I think that's how non-believers deal with the law. One of those two ways, or even both of those ways sometimes. And so God, going back to two, Psalm 2, 4, and 5, he says, the one who sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will hold them in derision. And then he speaks to them in his wrath. He distresses them in his deep displeasure. And this is what he says. This is incredible. This is awesome. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. 
Whew, I love this verse. The king is Jesus Christ. As you're going through the Old Testament, things written hundreds and thousands of years, you hear about this coming servant, it's Jesus. You hear about this Messiah, it's Jesus. You hear about this anointed one, it's Jesus. You hear about this king, it's Jesus. You hear about this eternal priest, high priest after the order of Melchizedek, it's Jesus. It's all Jesus. That's what that's what's amazing. The New Testament brings it to light. You hear about this coming great prophet, Deuteronomy 18. It's Jesus. All these prophecies are about Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit comes, it enlightens us that the whole Bible is pointing you towards Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Check out these verses. So I started with the thumbnail, Psalm 2, the king is coming. This is the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, and this is Mount Zion over here. It's true. This is truly incredible. These scriptures blow my mind. As for me, I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain, Psalm 2, 6. Guys, we know roughly where Jesus is coming back and or we know where he'll be within the first day or two of him coming back. It's a real place. You can Google image it. I do it all the time. I'm going to bring it up for you right now, whether you like it or not. It literally gets me excited. We know roughly where Jesus will come back. To me, that's just cool. He's really coming back to a real place. Check this out. 1000 BC, I've set my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Here's what you need to know. Jerusalem's built around four mountains. The temple is on Mount Moriah. There's Mount the Mount of Olives, okay? And then there's Mount Zion. But they're all like within a mile of each other. Like they're right there. They're all kind of talking about the same thing. Some of the mountains, like you could walk on the top to each other, right? So look at these verses. And there's so many more than this. I just have a couple I love. Joel chapter 3, 800 BC. I, I want you to go basically from Genesis to Revelation, looking at this. It says, the Lord roars from Zion. It says he utters his voice from Jerusalem. And Joel 3 is clearly a second coming prophecy. Zechariah 14, clearly a second sign of prophecy, uh, a second coming prophecy. It says on that day, his feet, Jesus's feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. That's Zechariah 14, 500 years before Christ. It, this is the Mount of Olives, literally right on the bottom here. And because Jews believe in the Old Testament, right, but they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, look, they put all these graves here. There's actually, here's another picture. There's thousands of graves on the Mount of Olives. This is the Mount of Olives from Mount Zion. So you can see they're this close. You can take a picture. These are all graves. It's like the most expensive real estate ever. It's so prophetic because the Jews, they only have like an earthly view of God. They don't really understand like eternal resurrection and all the high things that the spirit, you know, gives to us. What's amazing is Zechariah 14 is, you know, Old Testament. They don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, but his feet, they know that's talking about the Lord, right? So they all buy their, their, their funeral graves here so that when the Lord comes back, they'll be resurrected, right? I mean, it's sad in a sense. They haven't come to faith in Jesus, the Messiah, and that's the only way. But it's like a witness against them. They have all this scripture. They put their, they put their graves there, and yet they won't just come to Christ. They won't just come to the reality. So on that day, the day of the Lord, his feet stand on the Mount of Olives. Look how the New Testament in Acts, roughly 50 AD, uh, ties this to Jesus. So Zechariah 15, 14, on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. 500 BC, right? Jesus isn't even, isn't even born yet. Well, Acts 1, 50 AD, Jesus ascends to heaven. And then an angel comes to the disciples. He says, why do you stand here looking in the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. He will descend. Then immediately the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. Go read Acts 1. They're on the Mount of Olives. Jesus ascends. 500 years ago, it was written that the Lord's coming back. And on that day, his feet stand on the Mount of Olives. All of these things, the Lord roars from Zion. Psalm 2, I've installed my king upon Zion. Finally, you go all the way to Revelation 14. You're past the seven trumpet. You're literally right. You're probably like a month or two from Jesus coming back. Or Jesus is already like coming back. And John sees this vision. And of course, then I looked and saw the lamb standing on Mount Zion. It's right here. It's Jesus. This is where Jesus comes back. The Bible's so clear about it. I don't know where he first sets his feet down. But I know it's within, you know, a mile or two of this area. And it's just absolutely amazing. So from Psalm 2, 1000 BC, all the way to Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible, way after Jesus died. Then I looked and saw the lamb standing on Mount Zion. And right here, 
Behold, I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. This is what God says. This is how he responds to the nations raging. In his wrath, he's basically saying, it doesn't matter. My king is here. My king is here. Fear him. And this is what he says to the king. I love it. I love it. I will declare the decree. This is Jesus speaking now. The Lord Yahweh has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Paul brings this to light in the New Testament, Acts 13, 33. Sorry, that's not Paul. I'm, it's in my head right now. I just want to be honest with you guys. I forgot who wrote Acts. I believe it was Luke, but I could be wrong. It never matters to me because God wrote the entire Bible. <laughs> so Acts, I know Acts is New Testament. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. So God is saying that when he raised Jesus from the dead, he's fulfilling this in a way, as it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So that today is talking about Jesus was the son of God from all eternity, fully God. 2,000 years ago, he took on flesh. He was born. He, 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 he was the mediator, the God man, fully man and fully God, right? So that today, you're my son. Today, I've begotten you. Today, I have fathered you. That's talking about the incarnation of the word of God, the incarnation of the son of God. It says, so also Christ did not glorify himself uh, in Hebrews 5, 5 to become high priest but it was he who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. It's talking about Psalm 2. And so you have to understand, Jesus is fully man and fully God. I know that's a mystery, but we receive that by faith. And according to his God nature, he's the son of God, the image of the invisible God. But according to his human nature, he is a king. He is a prophet and he is a high priest. He is a mediator between God and man, fully man and fully God. So He's talking about, uh, Paul did write Hebrews. He's uh, speaking to them here. He says he became a high priest the day he was begotten, when he entered his creation. The son of God from all eternity entered his own creation to become a merciful and faithful high priest for us. And what's amazing is high priests always offer a sacrifice for the people. Jesus is a high priest. He offered himself as a sacrifice for his people. Truly amazing. So how would you explain to a non-believer that Jesus is fully man and fully God, his nature, his sonship. And forget about even saying non-believer or a believer, because you can be born again and not fully, like you get that Jesus is the Lord, that he is God. But to explain it or exegete it or talk about it can be a little bit confusing, right? And so pause and welcome back. <laughs> and so the way I do everything is with scripture. I mean, Jesus said, what saith the scripture? That's my response to everything. What's amazing about Psalm chapter two, verse seven, is it's like one of only two or three times in all the Old Testament where he calls the Messiah his son, right? He's son of man, son of God, right? Well, here's another one in Proverbs. It's truly amazing. It's, it's asking a question. It's a riddle. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who's gathered the wind in his fist? Who, who's bound the waters in a garment? Who's established all the ends of the earth? It's basically saying the creator, the creator has, right? What is his name and what is his son's name? If you know, I love this verse. It's basically saying the creator, what's his name? What's his son's name? It's a mystery. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. This is 700 years before Christ is even born. And in the New Testament, it's brought to light. It says, for unto us a child is born. That child was Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. Unto us a son is given. That son is the son of God from all eternity. And the father sent him. It says the government will be upon his shoulders. He'll be the world leader. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. So a child is going to be born. That's going to be Mighty God. That doesn't make sense. But it does in the incarnation. It does understand that the Messiah is God in human flesh. He's the everlasting father, the prince of peace. I just love that. A child is born, a son is given, who's the mighty God. It's so clear. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. It's just, I love confirming through scripture the deity of Jesus Christ. That's the foundation that his church is built on. If you do not believe Jesus is God, you are not born again. Okay? It doesn't mean you can't be twisted around and be confused but you need to understand that. 
When Jesus was baptized, it says, A voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. 1 Corinthians 2, 8, I love this, because Mormons will say that like Jesus separated from God for a certain period, and so he wasn't God on the cross, and this and that, and all this different heresy. No, Jesus was always God. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 2, 8, it says, None of the rulers of the age knew what God had ordained, that, Je that the Messiah would suffer and die. For had they known, they would not have crucified, and this is what they call Jesus. We know they're talking about Jesus because they crucified Jesus, and this is what they call him. I love it. The Lord of glory. So clearly Jesus is not a human being. He is the Lord of glory. They didn't cru uh, he's not claiming they crucified God in the heavens. He's saying they crucified the Lord of glory. So once again, the Messiah is deity. Jesus is God. Colossians 1 verse 15. I love this. Me, I'm like a straightforward meat and potatoes type of person. Like, yes, there's a mystery. Jesus is fully man and fully God. But it's like, how does my human brain understand that? I love Colossians. If you've ever just curious, like, what is Jesus? I am all the time. I love learning about Jesus. I just love this terminology is so straightforward. It's talking about Jesus, who we have forgiveness of sins, redemption through his blood. He's bought us back. And this is just saying, this is what Jesus is. He is the image of the invisible God. Oh, I love that. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, the ruler of all creation, for by him all things were created. Jesus, son of God from all eternity, by him all things were created. He's the creator. All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. All things were created through Jesus for Jesus. It's all about, it's just incredible to me. He is the image of the invisible God. That is what Jesus is. Finishing up Psalm 2 now, verses 8 through 11. Ask of me, ask of me the Father, and I will give you the Son, Jesus Christ, the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and you will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So this is talking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He came as a lamb. He died for us. He's coming back as a lion. He's coming back in fury. He's coming back to destroy his enemies and save his people, right? He's going to rule with a rod of iron, okay? Dashing them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And then there's a warning. It says, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth, whoever is alive at this time, the political leaders of the day. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So once again, it's saying this son is the Lord. That, that, I mean, it's just so clear and he's going to rule with authority. And so the question is, at Jesus' second coming, why would he have to rule with a rod of iron? When, when does this take place? Psalm 110, another messianic psalm. Jesus quoted this psalm, talks about this as well. I'm going to bring it up. Psalm 110 starts with, the Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai. And it's talking about, you know, the father talking to the son once again. Jesus used Psalm 110 to prove his deity, literally. I mean, you can go read it in the New Testament. But it says, the Lord will send the rod of your strength out of Zion. There's Zion again, right? There's, there's Zion again. <laughs> the Lord will send the rod of your strength, the Messiah's strength, out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Okay. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Revelation chapter two says we as born again, believers in Christ are actually going to get this authority as well. Paul said, we're going to judge angels and men, right? Uh, Jesus is talking to his churches and he says, he who overcomes and keeps my work until the end to him, I'll give power over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. They'll be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my father. So you see the father says, ask of me, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. You'll rule them with a rod of iron. You'll dash them. As Jesus received that authority from his father, we as followers of Jesus, he's our father, receive that authority from him. Okay. And the Bible is very clear. Revelation 20 verse four says, I saw thrones. They sat on them. Judgment was committed to them. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. This is after the tribulation, after Jesus has come back in rage, uh, those who hadn't worshiped the beast, the antichrist or his image, the image of the beast, the abomination, and didn't receive the mark of the beast. They didn't worship. They didn't fall away. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Uh, it also says, it goes down a few verses later, when the thousand years have expired, Satan is released from prison and there is one final rebellion 
right before the new heaven and new earth. And so the Bible is very clear. After Jesus' second coming, he rules with a rod of iron. He rules in the midst of his enemies. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah talks about the millennial kingdom, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. There's still sin on the earth. However, Satan is bound up. He is not deceiving the nations. The demons are bound up. There is still regular people. There's still people who are in sin. There's going to be believers and non-believers throughout the millennial kingdom. Isaiah says there's going to be death in the millennial kingdom. It says the sinner will die a hundred years old and people will think, you know, no, he did something wrong. Because in the millennial age, there'll be such rich blessings from Jesus on this earth. It'll be a Garden of Eden-like world. It'll be a greatly restored and renewed world under a great righteous king, Jesus Christ. But it won't be the new heaven and new earth. It won't be... Uh, perfection. There will still be death. There will still be a sun and a moon. Uh, Isaiah talks about that in, in, um, in new heavens and new earth. There's no sun. God is the light, right? There's no moon, none of that stuff. Cause there's no night and there's no sin and there's no death. But in the millennial kingdom, there's going to be a great restoration. Saints are going to be there in glorified eternal bodies. I mean, it's going to be truly amazing. However, it's not going to be perfect. And so he rules with a rod in the midst of his enemies and the church rules with him. It, he rules in perfect justice and righteousness. It's not a police state. He's just, he punishes sin. He, he's going to rule. Okay. And so Psalm 212, this is, he finishes up with a call to repentance. There's always mercy uh, with this Lord. Whenever we're looking at second coming prophecies and you, you get a little scared, you're like, wow, Lord, like this stuff is scary. Remember, as terrifying as this God is that scoffs at people, that speaks in his wrath, that rules with a rod of iron, this is the God who died for us. He sent his son to die for us. And right now he's just beckoning you. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me, be repent, believe, follow me. He will accept you no matter what you've done. He says, I, anyone who comes to me, I will not cast out. I mean, it's amazing that this God died for us and such a, he humbled himself, right? So it finishes with do homage, pay respect, worship the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled. Jesus said, I have a fire to, to be kindled and, uh, or I have a fire to bring to the earth and how I wish it were already kindled, right? So, uh, you know, basically repent, do homage, you know, worship him uh, for his wrath may soon be kindled. And then it says, how blessed are all who take refuge in him. And so one final question, why do we take refuge in the sun? What are we getting protection from? Super important. What are we protected from by taking refuge in the sun? Pause and welcome back. <laughs> so in the Old Testament, within the law, within the law, the law that kills us, <laughs> there's always mercy and forgiveness and sacrifice and grace. I love this take refuge. I believe it's talking about uh, the same language as the cities of refuge. Within the law, God commanded Moses, build these cities where if somebody's committed manslaughter, very serious sin, they can go there and flee from their persecutors. Even though they're a sinner, even though they deserve judgment, God wanted to show his grace. And he said, literally go and create a city. Let it have, you know, food and water, all these things. And they can go and flee for refuge from their per prosecutor, essentially from the other family that was going to kill them. And that's what we do with the son. We take refuge in him because of the crimes that we've committed, right? So why do we take refuge in the son? Protection from what? What does Jesus save us from? What does the son save us from? The son saves us from the wrath of God. The wrath of God is his righteous and holy hatred of sin. We're sinners. We've broken the law of God. So we justly and righteously deserve punishment for that. God has described his holiness as so ineffable and perfect that it's an infinite punishment in the lake of fire. Sin is incredibly serious with God. He will it, literally within God's name, it says he will not acquit the guilty. He will not do it. However, it also says that he is loving, kind, merciful, and gracious. And so because he will not dwell with sin, he will deal with sin. He made a way for guilty sinners to have eternal life eternal life in the presence of him with this God, serving this God and worshiping this God for all eternity. And this is what he, this is what he did. He sent his son from the son of God was, you know, the son of God from eternity past. He entered his own creation 
and he died for us. That's what he did. He On the cross, Jesus Christ took the wrath of God for me and you, that eternal hell that we couldn't imagine bearing. He took all of that in a few hours on the cross. He died for us. He bled for us. And if you believe in him, you have eternal life. God did that to show his righteousness, that he was going to forgive us. He took our sins. He put them on his son. And this is what he commands you to do. Repent. Turn away from those sins and believe in Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. He died for sinners. And he says, all you who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Become my disciple. He said, walk in the light so that you may become a child of light. So we take refuge in the sun to flee from the wrath to come. Uh, we do that. And the law shows us uh, our nature and that we, we have incurred quite the wrath and, and we justly deserve that. But thank God for Christ. He's merciful. And so that's what, that's what I believe is the answer to that question. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I know it was a little bit of a different format. Have a great day.